She broke out of a, a sealed room by finding an access panel. That has happened five million times in Star Trek. Starfleet does that. At the drop of a pin, they will just mess around with the door to get it open. That's not piracy. That's normalcy. <laughs> This is episode 6 of Lower Deck Season 3. Here I'll trust nothing. How about watch this video, click like. Eh, just kidding, you don't have to click like. We're over halfway through Lower Deck Season 3. Our last episode really delivered. This one does not. This episode fails to do some of the things the previous episode Reflections was attempting to do. However, I think, on the whole, it delivers just enough to get to the finish line. They're giving you a Tendi episode, okay? Old Nintendi finally has something to do. Uh, you would remember from my previous reviews that I complained about number one, Rutherford, number two, Tendi, not having anything to do. We had our Rutherford episode last week, so I'm totally fine with Rutherford playing second banana here. Rutherford is just kind of along for the ride, and I don't mind. Because we already had, like I said, our time with Rutherford. Rutherford, he might get one or two more good moments this season. That's enough Rutherford for me. I don't want to have too much. But as far as playing with my Tendi, I need a little bit more. This episode tried. Like I said, got to the finish line. But ultimately left me a little wanting. A little bit mystified and a little bit confused. Another not very funny episode. Should we be judging Lower Decks as something that should be funny? They're calling it a comedy. I don't find it funny, and I don't really mind. I'm more excited to watch these episodes lately. Had they uh, been more funny, maybe they would have been a little bit more crass. A little bit more, uh, shall I say, uh, stretching my uh, disbelief suspension a little bit too far until it snapped and I turned the episode off. Uh, I did not do that this time. Not funny. But interesting. Lord X, Season 3. Where do we go from here, right? Are we going up? Are we going down? We're going to find out in the coming weeks. But for now, let's see what went on in Here I'll Trust Nothing. What does that name mean? Am I missing something? We heard a lot of things. I generally trusted everything, except for Quark. Uh, let's get right into it. Uh, you see... The Cerritos and the Vancouver. Note, we do not see the Vancouver, unfortunately. The Vancouver has been waylaid and is doing something else. Uh, something to do with a brown hole. That's right, we have brown holes in space. <laughs> and they gotta see to it that things go swimmingly in the brown hole. Or what have you. Regardless, this is a post-Dominion War episode, you see. It's only been a few years since uh, the end of Deep Space Nine. End of Deep Space Nine. <laughs> when this takes place, you see, the Dominion War is still fresh in our minds. Fresh wounds. Don't pick at the scab. Okay. Uh, we need to reopen trade negotiations with the Karema. Okay, we need to rebuild our relationship. You may remember the Karema from previous Star Trek shows. I remember their ship. The Karema ship uh, famously has been reused to play many other ships. You see, it's one of those ships that looks just bland enough that you could call it belong to any race. And the Karema ship has not been altered for this episode, which I like. See, you know, they could have taken the, time, taken the time to design a totally new ship for the Karema. Or they could have gave the wink and the nod and the nudge nudge to the original Trek who had ships reused for every such thing. Uh... Like uh, the Mondor, I've seen that a million times. Uh, and this is the Karema ship, I've seen it a million times. It's not a bad design. It looks alright, it serves its purpose, and it's here again. So, no Vancouver, but we have the Karema ship. Not a fair trade at all, but at least we got something. The Karema arrived at Deep Space Nine, as well as the Cerritos. The Cerritos, <laughs> in our pre-intro sequence takes the time to sail around Deep Space Nine and just look at the pylons. How do we dock? I don't know. Just fly around it and pretend we're in awe of the pylons. And then it plays the Deep Space Nine theme. And I kid you not, 
when the sequence was over and they actually were playing the Deep Space Nine scene, I was wondering where the next bit was in the in the track. You know, where's the bit that goes da 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 at the end? And then I realized that's the Paramount logo. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> I guess like nowadays, right? You don't really watch the end credits, right? See, I would watch the end credits on television every time. And the little station bumpers and things like that. And you just, you miss it now, right? So, this is the first time, like, unexpectedly, the Deep Space Nine theme all the way through was just dropped on me. And they use the same kind of music in the credits for Deep Space Nine. And I guess in my mind, for the credit sequence, I started to believe that the last bit was part of the theme because da 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 sounds like Deep Space Nine, you know, ba 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 but that's just paramount. <laughs> so anyway, uh, sorry for that little aside, but um, we have our A plot, and it's the only plot that matters. We have nasty B plot, C plot, D plot, whatever. It's just a big kerfuffle. You see, our A plot means something. The rest of it is just kind of a a lost D Space Nine episode <laughs> that uh, smacks of. The boring episodes of Deep Space Nine, uh, the predictable, the uh, the slow, uh, and not in a good way, episodes that people originally didn't like. Um, you see, Quark is in this episode, and Kieran and Reese. Their actors reprising their roles. Uh, Quark sounds mostly all right, and he looks pretty good, but Kira to me, I I don't know. There's just something. Did you notice this? If you watched this, did you notice that Kira, like, just doesn't look right? I think her head is just, like, 2% too big or something, or it's the hair or something. It just didn't... Something about it was just saying, flashing in my mind, that this was a zombie or something. Like, this was Uncanny Valley Kira. Like, there was something wrong with it. She looked dead. I don't know how to explain it. Maybe if I had a few more episodes to look at cartoon Kira, I, it would grow on me. But uh, as it stands right now, I just felt like there was something wrong with it. Um, also, her voice sounds about 20 years older, which is weird because this is only a few episodes after D Space Nine. Uh, I guess you could possibly say the same for Quark if you listen, but he's kind of putting on an affect to his voice anyway, so it kind of hides it a little bit, right? Playing a Ferengi and whatnot. Uh, listen, they're supposed to be meeting the Vancouver, the Karema. But in their place, she has to. They have to meet Captain Freeman. They were supposed to meet Captain N G U Y E N. Seen it written lots, not pronounced a lot. I'm gonna take it at face value that you pronounce it Gwen. That seems to be how they pronounce it on the show. I'm just gonna trust them. They wanted to see Captain Gwen. We got discount Qua Captain. We got discount Captain Gwen with uh, <laughs> with uh, Captain Freeman. Uh, but guess what? We got lots of liquor. Okay. We got the mind altering liquor. Will you listen to us now? We're reopening trade negotiations, and we're going to sweeten the deal with mind-altering liquid. That sounds great. Uh, guess what, though? Kira spots Shax. Shax is a fellow Bajoran. Oh my god, we are off to the races. Did you see Deep Space Nine? The whole show? Were you tired of the Bajoran plots? Like, maybe... Yeah, I get that it's... Bajoran stuff plays a big role, but were you getting tired of it a little in that show? Uh, I didn't like seeing it come back, because I knew the moment Shax hit it off with Kira, we're just going to have old war stories for places I don't know anything about and and don't share an, an affiliation with. So I knew it wasn't going to be funny. It wasn't going to be interesting. And I also knew it was going to go on for the whole dang episode. And it did. It was boring from frame one to the final frame of Kira and Shaq's talking. So I was kind of zoned out from that. 
we did see Cisco's baseball throwing it up in the air. Yeah, Sturfly throws us a few curveballs here and there. What else is new? Uh, Tendi and Rutherford. This is the bulk of our A plot, okay? We've set up the backdrop. We're on D Space Nine. Tendi and Rutherford are at Quark's bar as well as Boimler. Boimler's playing Dabo in a plot that goes nowhere. He plays Dabo. He wins. We're done. That's <laughs> that's the Boimler plot. Is it a C plot? That sounds more like a G plot or something. However, uh, Tendi meets another Orion. Kira meets another Bajoran. Tendi meets another Orion. Uh, you'd think they'd hit it off. Tendi's a very nice person. But as soon as this character, Mesk, another Orion, started talking, she was immediately off-put. I mean, you can tell he was supposed to be a... Uh, not hitting it off with Tendi, maybe they're going to be a little bit of a, a, a frenemies, uh, not you know going to be into a fight, going to get into a fight. But Tendi immediately was on the was on defense as soon as he showed up, and I was thinking, oh my god, Tendi knows this guy from somewhere. That's not that's not the case. She Tendi just immediately hated him. Maybe hate's a strong word, but. Did anyone else notice this? The Tendi came off really, like, mean this episode. Like, here we finally have Mesk. He's happy-go-lucky, jovial, willing to have a good time, as am I. Rutherford's having a great time. But Tendi's just like, oh, no. Can't, don't, don't anyone have any fun in our comedy show? Like, I, it's just seeming really strange to me. Uh, this Tendi, who is normally so open-minded and, and so nice, just couldn't see, couldn't properly gauge the immaturity of Mesk and treat him appropriately. She instead allowed her anger to well up until she just exploded at him, okay? Mesk finds a way to get involved in all their nonsense. Uh, Tendi and Rutherford are supposed to be delivering supplies to the Karama ship, so they're inside the Deep Space Nine pylon. Guess what? Mesk uh, has ruffled uh, a few elbows and, uh, you know, rubbed a few feathers, and he managed to get on security detail for our friends Tendi and Rutherford. And it goes exactly as unswimmingly as you think, as Mess starts to sing old pirate shanties. Okay? Uh, Tendi doesn't get involved in the, in the festivities. Instead, she just gets angry, and then why do you associate Orion's with pirates all the time? We're not just all pirates. Well, yeah. I, like, if somebody is in Starfleet, I don't... I don't take it seriously when they say they're, like... They're all gung-ho about piracy. Like, I don't think they really mean it. Like, and, you know... Mesk probably thought, great, and Orion, this is the one time I can get to make these jokes, right? I, not so with Tendi. Uh, you see, Tendi... You know, everybody should just embody this stuffy uh, automaton... Uh, persona who all, and we all think the same everyone just be the same right you know no one go out no one go too far out the bounds you know we we uh we ought to allow a certain amount of uh cultural eccentricities lest we embody our enemies worst personifications of us that we are mindless automatons who are all the same and we're not um So, their backgrounds are a little different, though. So, it's it's not it's not what you think. It's a little deeper than that. You see, Mask, in the heat of the moment, um, turns out he's not really from Orion. He's never been to Orion. Tendi is actually descended from pirates proper, if you can call them proper. And uh, doesn't that complicate things, right? See, they take it, they show you one thing, it's the opposite. Where, what, what do you do with that, right? You see, back at Quark's bar, uh, the Karama, uh, disassemble, we'll say, the Quark 2000 replicator machine to discover that the machine was, uh, created from stolen Karama parts. 
So they try to arrest Quark, and one of their contingency plans for this is to throw an object that disables Deep Space Nine's power supply. And wouldn't you know it, the Cerritos as well, because the Cerritos is not on its own uninterrupted power supply. Uh, it's not under internal power, as it were. So we've disabled everybody. Deep Space Nine's disabled. Cerritos is disabled. Uh, our Karama friends and Quark beam over to their ship. But we've locked Tendi, Rutherford, and Mesk in the Karama ship's airlock. What are we going to do? Mesk, why don't you use your cool Orion piracy powers? I'm not a real pirate. I made it all up. I learned it all from hollow novels. Isn't that the thing, right? You see, he says he's from Ohio. I think that's what he said. So callously ejected from his host culture. Brought into Starfleet. Acts a certain way. Absorbs his host culture through the lens of movies, essentially. You know? He's experiencing his history through an inauthentic means, that being movies produced for entertainment purposes. Real life isn't entertaining. Real life isn't a fun, happy reality superimposed over actual reality. The Wild West wasn't cowboys running around on horses shooting guns willy-nilly. The Wild West was more like starving to death alone in the blazing heat with a snake in your boot. Maybe that's a little extreme, but I think you get the point, you know. So he was a hyper-realized version of himself. He was not himself. He was the, he was the himself he assumed that he had to be from watching hollow novels, slash movies, whatever, what have you. But Tendi is the genuine article, okay? So in a way, and you may, you may notice this in reality, Mesk is embodying an electrified, overly extreme version of himself, and Tendi is her actual self. What you would think here, for Mesk to learn his lesson, is that he would learn to, to save the day being himself, right? That's how you win in that character arc. Instead, Mesk's character arc ends here. He, he whimpers, gets down on his knees. I'm not, in re I'm not a real Orion. I'm not a pirate. What have you. I'm sorry. And then Tendi goes ninja mode and saves the day using piracy powers. Which, if you had turned this episode on in the middle of it and had never heard them talk about piracy or Orion pirates, you would think that Tendi has been uh, possessed by the soul of Starfleet tactical and or special ops. What was piratey about this? She broke out of a, a sealed room by finding an access panel. That has happened five million times in Star Trek. Starfleet does that. At the drop of a pin, they will just mess around with the door to get it open. That's not piracy. That's normalcy. <laughs> um, and then she just runs around a corner takes out this guy with a, 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 a an Orion multi-tool type device that Mesk has. And then she just steals a tooth out of this guy, uses the tooth to to uh, decouple um, ship controls and or short-circuit something to uh, arrest control of the ship before it escapes to the wormhole. Really MacGyvering this shit up. And... Uh, I don't know, that just seems like something that would happen in any Star Trek episode. You would deduce it logically. Piracy to me, it seems like maybe Tendi would be able to make clever use of a tractor beam in a way that Starfleet had never considered. Uh, she may know inherently weak points in ship's uh, structure that we may not be able to gauge. Things like that. Maybe she knows... What's valuable? What's not? You know? Uh, but as far as turning into a space ninja, I don't know. I didn't really get anything out of it. I'm sure there was many uh, opportunities in the recent past where Tendi could have really used these skills to save the day, but she didn't. 
now we've introduced that dissonance with Tendi, which is going to make me wonder um, forever. So that's that's definitely a negative. Tendi saves the day, and I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. I did get a Tendi episode, and like I said, it got to the finish line. We got to see another side of Tendi. Tendi helps out a fellow Orion, although that Orion never got his win. We introduced a one-off character just to take a dump on them, which is always a bad idea. The ship returns to Deep Space Nine. We apprehend the Karema, only to find out, why didn't they say this to begin with, they were arresting Quark. And rightly so, Quark did steal the replicator technology from the Karema. Again, that part of the story is your lost Deep Space Nine episode that's frankly not very good. Quark does something. He says he's innocent. Turns out he's guilty. Causes an international incident. Or interstellar incident? Where have I seen that before? And I love Deep Space Nine. But, uh... I just can't help but feel like this is uh, too little, too late, and a... Uh, uh, a fun cameo appearance of our characters from Deep Space Nine, but ultimately doesn't build on Deep Space Nine, doesn't say anything about Deep Space Nine, and uh, doesn't present, especially with Kira's case, doesn't present anything compelling for these characters. Okay? It would have been really easy to have Kira and uh, Quark just to show up for one scene and leave, but they didn't do that. They tried to work them into the plot, so they're getting points for that. It's easy to take fan-favorite characters and sleazily shove them in where they don't belong. But it's a lot harder to write a plot that actually involves them. Um, and Deep Space Nine is just a cool place to go to. Uh, our B-plot, what even happened, right? That was our episode. The A-plot was the plot that meant something. Our B-plot intertwines with the A-plot in an interesting way. You see... We're following Kira and Aris. Quark has a few scenes with the Karema. He doesn't like the Karema. Like I said, fresh wounds after the Dominion War. Uh, Mariner, in the most harebrained, sad, pathetic, unfunny, uninteresting, useless C or D plot I've ever seen. She goes to a, a salon, which I think is just a party? You know, universal translators being what they are. We can't figure out weird words like salon other than for a barber, but uh, yeah, not not the not the doctor. I mean, barber that cuts your hair. Uh, so salon to me, I don't know what that means, but I know what a party is. I think, although I've never been to one, uh, we're having a get together. We'll say, uh, finally, Mariner gets some time off to spend with Jennifer, the uh, Andorian lady. Uh, they go to this party filled with all these other crew members, and they're making candles? Sounds like a lot of fun. But is this meta-commentary on the whole candles idea? I noticed this. Did you notice this? It's a little bit esoteric, it's a little bit nebulous, and a little bit strange, but I've noticed a lot in Star Trek that, yes, on a starship, open flame is a bad idea. It's usually a, sec it's, it's usually a hazard. It's like it's, it's, it's a risk. You see many scenes of people trying to put out fires. Don't like that. We can't have open flame. That birthday cake with that candle that's lit on it, that was a fire hazard. And so on and so forth. But now we have a room full of candles. I think there's a joke hidden inside there somewhere that they may have inadvertently made. <laughs> but we have a room full of candles. Uh, you see candles are not allowed until they are. Uh, Vulcans have candles all the time. Klingons. I guess we're just having a, a little candelabra of a day here, whatever that means. We're having, we're, we're lighting some candles to make some candela in the room light up. Uh, yep. What's that song about candlestick? Something, something, candlestick, something. I don't know, am I dreaming that up? Anyway, when they lose power from our A-plot, you remember that, uh, we realize that these candles are burning twice as much oxygen as normal. As normal, and they're stealing the oxygen out of this room. Uh, life support systems have been uh, interrupted momentarily. 
These are special candles. The wax is different. It burns more oxygen. And we're going crazy. We're going from lack of oxygen. We're losing our minds. Oh my gosh. What am I going to do? Well, Jennifer tells Mariner, who mysteriously, they're not losing their minds. Why don't you just phaser them all? You see, you burn a lot less oxygen in your lungs when you're phasered away into an unconscious state. Set phasers to stun. <clears throat> well... Mariner looks like she's enjoying it a little bit. Uh, this is my salon. You can't do that and blah, 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 blah. Well, this is my phaser. Psst. <laughs> I, think, I think I audibly gasped from this insane situation of Mariner phasering a whole bunch of the crew members into a stunned state. I think normally if this happened, they would just say... You know, I need to phaser you people. I need to stun you. Line up and get stunned. It's not going to hurt that bad. And then we'll burn less oxygen and we'll survive. Everybody understand? Yep, okay. She just, she did it like she was enjoying it. She did it like she was damning them. And she did it without warning. That's really something, Mariner. In an episode where you got called bossy. And I said, you ain't bossy. You mean Nasty. You know? Not bossy. Uh, bossy is people who know what to do and want you to do it. Uh, mean is when you take the opportunity to start phasering your friends and enjoying it. You can call them not friends, but you can call them fellow officers, I think, you know. Maybe that's a little bit more serious than phasering friends. It really smacks of that time in Strange New Worlds where we saw two characters aim phasers at each other and shoot each other in part of, as part of some kind of strange game. Enterprise Bingo, something like that. You know, scenes that make you go, hmm. Scenes that make you go, what? <laughs> well, we got one here. Anyway, at the very end, they phaser themselves. Everybody in the room's asleep. Nobody's to blame. For the candle making gone wrong. Was that fun? Was that weird side plot fun to anyone? <laughs> it's a little bit strange. But uh, it doesn't really put the brakes to a pretty good episode overall, I must say. That was Lower Decks Season 3. Episode 6. Here all, trust nothing. What did I hear? What did I trust? I don't know. Visually, we're at Deep Space Nine. How can I really complain? How can you complain? Okay. Deep Space Nine rendered in all its glory. And you just know, if this showed up in Picard or Discovery... Not Discovery. How could it show up in Discovery? Yeah, they kind of just bypassed the Discovery. So just Picard. You know it would just be blurry nonsense with... Strange lens artifacting, bloom everywhere, lens flares, and just like tons of post processing over the frame. You wouldn't be able to tell what was going on. Low, what you get with lower decks, though, is a clean looking show. Although animated, somehow more closely resembles old Trek. Go figure. The Cerritos is there, the Karema ship is there. We go inside the Karima ship. It's always cool going inside an alien ship. Visually, I think we're we're doing pretty good. Sound-wise, the Deep Space Nine theme is back. References don't make the show, but they do make me enjoy it because I'm I'm simple that way. You see, play the old music. You got me interested. Maybe you don't feel that. I feel that in my bones. <sighs> right up my skeleton. Deep Space Nine theme. Notably missing the Paramount jingle at the end. We also saw Morn in this episode. He was a corpse bearer. Wouldn't shut up for the entire episode. The entire episode was Morn this, Morn that, screaming and hollering. Take a chill pill, Morn. Thematically, we're really just getting something out of the A-plot. Everything to do with Quark, Nerys, uh, the Kirima, 
uh, Mariner meant nothing to me. Ultimately, it said nothing. Much ado about nothing. You know, full of fire and fury, signifying crap. Uh, but in our A plot, the primary story of this episode, I'd say, Mesk, Tendi, and Boimler were learning again, like in Reflections, we're learning about her past self, okay? Tendi's past self is the genuine pirate. Mesk's past self is Mesk, okay? It's the Ohio Mesk. It's Mesk alone. It's Mesk without piracy. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mesk was afraid to be Mesk. Last episode, Rutherford was not afraid to be the new Rutherford. You see how in with the old, out with the old, in with the new. Context, you see. Letting your old self is good in the proper context go away. But finding your new self can be just important. Just as important, Mesk found the new Mesk. He found the Starfleet Mesk. If only he got that victory, right? If only he got the victory he needed to learn that he could win as himself... Mesk would have completed his character journey in this one episode. Maybe that was written out? It did feel to me like something was written out with Boimler. Boimler wins at Dabo, and then he just wins at Dabo. And then he trades his winnings for a, a gift card. That's your Boimler plot. Was something cut out there for time? Was something cut out with Mesk? Was Mesk supposed to do something else here? I got that feeling. If we had have completed a good Boimler plot and had Mesk get the win, while not overshadowing Tendi at all, this could have been a really good episode. But that being said, what we're left with is an okay episode. It reflects the episode reflections, but it doesn't necessarily stick the landing. It just lands. We get a Tendi episode. Who am I to complain? It wasn't funny. But is that everything? I don't think so. The theme is what sells the episode. Remember that. That's what you remember. You're not going to remember weird space battles. You're going to remember how you felt when something important happened. Something that spoke to you. Does, did this episode speak to you? It kind of spoke to me a little bit. We've all had problems coming to terms with our own host cultures especially when you join Starfleet, and finding where that puzzle piece fits in to the overall puzzle of your life. Okay, do you throw out that puzzle piece? Do you put it back in? Do you get a new piece? You see, a good companion piece to the previous episode. This has been Star Trek Lower Decks Season 3, Episode 6, Here All Trust Nothing. Interesting that this is episode 6, because I'm awarding it a 6. <laughs> it's about as good as the first episode of this season. Maybe a little better, but not enough to put it into the 6.5 range. And not enough to be a 7, certainly. This one, it's a maybe for me if I'm going to return to it. Just to see Quark and Kira again. Although their voices are a little bit strange, and Kira looks a little bit odd. Alright, I'm Lieutenant Mark. Thanks for... Your support with the past video, uh, Kip Ashing a New Titan A. Uh, I like the performance of that video. I'm happy that someone was interested in videos I've been doing other than reviews. Um, if you like that format, should I do more videos with like like a more scripted style presentation about other ships I've made? Is Is that video popular because it's topical or is it popular because it's good? I don't know, but thanks for watching it. I'm Lieutenant Merrick, and I'm going to see you at the soonest possible point when I can see you again. So, goodbye.